God, we should bless you tonight. I want to greet you again in the most exalted name of Jesus. I want to thank you all who have come on for Bible study tonight. And I pray, God, that at the end of the session, again, that we will learn something from the word. I must tell you that tonight, there's a lot that we're going to cover. Amen. But at the same time, I strongly believe that if we learn to apply some of these things that we'll be looking at tonight, then we will realize how better we'll be at getting it into the word of god amen we're talking about the power of the word amen i want to ensure that we are able to use the word properly amen i've never seen a soldier been sent to war without learning how to use his weapon praise god so tonight we're talking about the power of using the word of god but we want to use the word of god correctly before we get into the word let us just bow our heads as i get into prayer and then we will get into the study tonight Great God, we thank you, Lord God, for one more night. We thank you, Lord God, for your love, your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness, which is better than life. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have, praise God, to get into the word of God, to rightly divide the word of truth. We pray, God, tonight that as we are about to study your word one more time, that the word will find a place in our hearts. Help us, Lord Jesus, to apply what we have learned. Help us, Lord Jesus, to take our time, God, and to make our notes and to try to make it applicable to our lives so that we can rightly divide your word of truth. God, we look to you tonight, continue to bless this house, continue to bless every person who will watch and let your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So tonight we will be, let me just remind you, of what we intend to cover for the next, amen, few weeks in relation to our Bible study. Great, guys. So we did say last week that for the next few weeks, we'll be looking at, for example, the topic of the power of the word of God. Amen. And we did, last week, we did an introduction to the power of the word. I mean, and what a good time we had in getting into that particular subject. Tonight, we'll be looking at the second area in relation to the power of the word. Before we can actually do anything else, we need to have an idea of how to study the word of God. So tonight, our aim is to look at how to study the word. Now, let's just jump into our key verse. Our key verse is from 2 Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study, 2 Timothy 2, 15, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he will find that Paul was writing or instructing Timothy. And Timothy was a young leader in the early church. Actually, he was a pastor in the church, I think in Ephesus. And he was instructing him on how to conduct himself in his ministry. You know, a lot of us will do things in the house of God and the same principle apply. Tonight, I want us to understand that there is a way that we can conduct ourselves in doing ministry. And the emphasis, if you look at it at the verse, was really on it, diligently studying or accurately studying and teaching the word of God. Praise God. And Paul was stressing to Timothy the importance of being an approved worker, praise God, for God. One who is not embarrassed, one who is not ashamed uh, because of poor workmanship. But instead, he's saying to Timothy that is, he should aim to handle the word of God, the scriptures, correctly. And he must aim that he can both correctly uh, teach it and apply it, that it aligns with the true meaning of what the scripture was actually saying. So there are a couple of key words that jump out at me, and I made note of them, the word study, the word rightly divide, and the word, uh, the word of truth. Now let's just define what that means first. And then we will get into where we want to go. So Paul said to Timothy, study. The word study implies diligent and effort. And it suggests that one should diligently and 
and um should be diligent and earnest in their efforts. So one he's saying that you must study, you must, you must, you must diligently do it. You must be, you must make all the effort so that you can earn that you can actually uh get into what the scripture is saying. So I would say the word study implies diligence and effort. It suggests that one should be diligent and earnest in their efforts. The next part is what I find very important too, the word rightly divide. It's interesting that Paul used the term rightly divide. And this phrase means to handle accurately or to interpret correctly. It means that you can take up your Bible. A lot of people will read the Bible and they read it incorrectly. A lot of people will read the Bible and they do not uh, rightly divide it. So the word rightly divide here comes from a Greek word, which means to cut straight. And it suggests precision and care in handling the scripture. It means that when you, when if you're tasked at looking at a verse, better yet, whenever you look at the verse, it's important that we cut straight. We there is precision, there is care. We don't want to just read the Bible for reading Bible's sake. We want to ensure that what we are reading, we are understanding it properly. And then the last phrase I want to make note of is the phrase "the word of truth." And, and this suggests that you're talking about the Bible itself. So these are some of the stuff that we want to understand as we get into the subject tonight. The objective of the study is fourfold. One, there is the need for interpretation. So tonight we're going to look at the nature of what we call the interpreter and the nature of the scripture. Because these two things play a very important role in us understanding or getting into what the Bible actually means. So the nature of the interpreter and the nature of the scripture. Next, we want to look at what we call biblical interpretation because as we as we talk about the, the scripture itself and the interpreter, we want to look at how people actually do interpretation because some persons will do exegesis and don't worry about the big words. I'm going to define them clearly in, in, in the lesson tonight. And some persons do eisegesis. Amen. I, I want to see the difference and, and, and even examine ourselves to see at some points, am I exegeting the verse or am I eisegeting the verse? So we want to get into these things. Um, then we're to look quickly at 10 principles of interpretation. 10 principles that you can make note of as you get into biblical interpretation. And last, we're going to apply what is called a grammatical historical method for biblical interpretation. Praise God. So these are the fourfold objectives that we have tonight. Now, I must let us understand that about four years ago, I did a study on uh, I need to understand the word or I cannot understand the word health. And tonight we're going to be using that lesson. I, I thought about it and I said, boy, there was so much content to cover here. And I thought about it. I think it would be interesting for us to use that particular study so that we can uh, be refreshed for some of us. And for some of us that where the information is new, where we can learn from the word of God. So tonight I want us to, again, make use your pen. Because before we can actually start using our sword, we need to know how to use our sword. And therefore, tonight, the aim is to get into these topics. So I want us to buckle down, but at the same time, be attentive as we get into this scripture tonight, as we get into this study tonight. God bless you as we move over into what was done before, but is still applicable even for today. Let's get into the word in Jesus' name. Let's first start by defining what interpretation means. We want to understand the Bible, or another term, we want to interpret the scriptures. And the, the word interpret actually means to make things plain. It's got intention that he wants us to make things plain. But there are two things that hinder us from actually making those things plain sometimes. So interpret the scriptures require us to take into consideration two main things. One, the nature of the interpreter. That's you. The nature of the interpreter. And the second big thing we have to take into consideration when we look into uh, how we can interpret scriptures is also the nature of the scripture itself, the nature of the Bible itself. Praise God. Let us just dig down into this. Let's just look at the nature of the interpreter, which is you. Praise God. 
Now, one of the things that happens is that every time somebody comes to the Bible, or they read the Bible, or every reader of the Bible is an interpreter at that same time. So a lot of times you take the Bible and you read it and you have a picture in your mind about what is taking place in that particular instance. But the problem is that the reader tends to read into the Bible their own preconceived notion about particular words, phrases, and sentences. And then you're going to realize a lot of times that what you thought was so was not necessarily so. Um, and, and that's for a varied reason. But one of the things we don't want to do, we don't want to do what is called eisegesis. And since I use that big word, let's just define it. Amen? So to read the biblical passage in such a way that it introduces our own beliefs, our outlines, our own preconception into and onto the text is what is called eisegesis. E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. And the word eisegesis comes from the Greek preposition eik, which actually means into. So the act of leading a meaning into a biblical passage, the act of trying to put onto the passage what we think it actually means. And a lot of people have book of people who read scriptures and, and, and they come to the scripture already thinking that this is what the scripture actually is saying. And that's based on their culture based on their background based on how they grew up based on how they view their family setting all of these things but we don't want to do that we don't want to do what is called eisegesis when we go to a scripture we don't want to put our meaning the correct way to actually do scriptures is by let's just look at another term um it's called exegesis now exegesis is derived from the greek exegestai and, and it means to lead out or to interpret from. It means to show the way or to guide. So exegesis, brothers and sisters, is the act of leading out of or pulling from the scriptures the intended meaning of the biblical passage. So a lot of people, when they come to scriptures, they eisegesis the scriptures but we don't want to do that we want to exegete the scriptures we want to pull out the intended meaning so exegesis and our definition is the bringing out of the text the meaning the writer intended to convey and which their readers we are expecting to gather from it so you have to understand when paul wrote our timothy well timothy didn't write when paul wrote out all the other biblical writers wrote scriptures they had a message that they wanted to send across to us I mean, and that's what we want to get. We want to exegete. We want to get what they, what their intention, what 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 they intended for us to get from the passage. Praise God. So we don't want to eisegete. We want to exegete. How do we do that? Praise God. No, a good example of eisegesis. And now, note, we don't want to eisegesis. No, we want to exegete. So a good example of eisegesis that I can think about is is how people interpret Saint John chapter twelve. And verse 32 and it's a very familiar verse and it was Jesus who was actually talking and Jesus made a very profound statement in st. John chapter 12 verse 32 he said and I if I be lifted up from the earth I will draw all men unto me now have you ever been to a any church setting and, and we are church people and you hear people around the pulpit go up and say jesus said if i be lifted from this earth i will draw all men unto me amen and this is how they interpret that particular verse many people use this in praise and worship sessions so a lot of praise and worship leaders would go around the pulpit and they would say we must lift jesus in praise and worship and he will draw sinners to himself so they're saying brethren worship god and, and, and nothing's wrong with that. We are supposed to worship God. The Bible said, they that worship him must worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. But, and they use this particular verse that Jesus said in St. John chapter 12 to say that this is what he was talking about. But the context of the scripture has nothing, brothers and sisters, to do with praise and worship. Because, guess what happened now? The following verse plainly gives the explanation for what Jesus was talking about. So, people eisegete the scripture by thinking he's talking about praise and worship. But look at the, the verse that follows it. 
in verse 33, and this is where the context is found, we realize it has nothing at all to do with praise and worship. Because the following verse plainly gives the explanation for what Jesus was actually talking about. Are we talking about how trying to interpret scriptures, right? This is what Jesus said in verse 33. He said, this he said, signifying, I'm quoting verse 33. This he said, signifying one death he should die. So, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He's talking about Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And it is through the cross that he pulls sinners to him. It has nothing to do with praise and worship. This signifies the death he should die. Through the cross and through the cross, sinners are pulled to him. So that's his proper exegesis and that eisegesis. Now let's look at the nature now of scripture. So we have a problem because we uh, come to it with our own preconceived mind. But there's also the nature of scripture. The Bible has two main characteristics that need to be considered when we interpret scriptures. One, the Bible is divinely inspired. So, it is God who inspires scripture. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God, the scripture says. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It was divinely inspired by God. But also, the Bible has a human context. By that I mean, God, even though it was inspired by God, God used men to write the Bible. So therefore, men had a way how they think in those times, so on and so forth. So if we take into consideration the nature of scripture, let's continue on this point. Because the word of God is divine, it has eternal relevance that demand our attention and our obedience. So it is in inspired by God and therefore it has eternal relevance in our lives but because the word of God has human context we have to discern the historical particularity and apply general and generic specific rules to the many literature genres in scriptures by that I mean men wrote based on how they see their time based on how they speak based on god never give them no additional big words so based on how they spoke god used their their their, their knowledge how they related to life and use it as a part of putting it to scripture hope that makes sense praise god so the task of interpreting the scriptures comes at two levels one there's what is called the exegetical analysis of the original intent of the biblical text. So what, as I said, exegesis is pulling out the intent in me. So we have to do what is called an exegetical analysis. And that is where we actually pull out the intended meaning from the text. And then you have what is called a hermeneutical application of the text. Hermeneutics is the science and the art of interpreting the scriptures. So these are the two tasks. That comes to play whenever we want to interpret scriptures the exegetical analysis and the hermeneutical application all right let us take this a little bit further praise God now brothers and sisters one of the things was understanding that exegesis must be done when we read every text by using question relating to both the content of the scripture and the context of the scripture right so let's say that again you have to take into consideration the content and you have to take into consideration the context both are very important when you talk about your exegeting a particular verse of scripture um the content um what type of content it is is it uh you, you know we have to read it through to get what it's saying and the context now why did he say this where does this thing fall context means a difference uh even in general life you know somebody might say something and the context in which they say it can determine if it's good or bad same thing applying scriptures the context is very important now the context also can be either what you call the historical so it can be historical context it's have to do with the time and the culture of the author, the audience, the geographical, the topographical, the political factors, the occasions, and the purpose of each book. And this is very important because, I mean, uh, you can realize a lot of things as it relates to history. You have to take it to consider it's, its historical context. So, for example, you will look, for example, in the book of Daniel, and you will see, for example, the king 
couldn't get rid of Daniel, couldn't get him from coming from under, going into the lines then, even though he tried all the laws all the night. He couldn't do anything to stop that. And you know why he couldn't stop it? He could not stop it simply because he it was during the time of where the Medo Persians rule. I'm gonna show you how historical context is very important. Look at this now. During the time of the Babylonians, what usually happened is that the law uh, was not higher than the king. And therefore, when Nebuchadnezzar made a law, it, it, anything he said go. He had the ability to break the law. He had the ability to, 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 to do what he wanted to do. The king was higher than the law. But under King Darius, which, who was the king who threw Daniel into the lion's den, the law, and that was the laws of the Middle and the Persians, was higher than the king. So when they, couldn't, when they couldn't find an occasion against Daniel, but against his God, they realized that the man prayed a lot. So what did they do? They set up a law that if you worship any other god or pray to any other god within a certain time frame, then you'd be thrown into the lion's den. And they got King Darius, who never understood who it was at the time, to seal that particular law with his ring. And from it was sealed with the ring of the king of the, Med of the Medes and the Persians. It became law. And therefore, when it came law, the king could not stop it. The Bible said he spent a whole night trying to figure out a way to get Daniel out, and he couldn't. Because the law of the Medes and the Persians determined that. And that's historical context that lets you understand what was taking place right there. Another thing about context is what lit literary. We can we have to ask the questions of the sentence passages. What is the meaning in relation to the preceding and succeeding sentences? So like the example we used earlier, we understood um, what Jesus was saying in St. John chapter 12, verse 32, based on the verses which follows it. So that is what you call the immediate context. We realize instantly that Jesus was not talking about praise and worship because the verses after it explains what was taking place. But there are contexts we have we call remote context where we have to go wider and we have to sometimes read the entire chapter, forget what is happening, or read sometimes the entire book. Or sometimes we have to read even as wide as learn in the relation to scripture. But that is where we have to take into consideration. That is context. And it's very important in interpreting scriptures. Praise God. Now the content now has to do with the meaning of the words your grammatical relationship in sentences and comparison of manuscripts. So we we can do a proper exegetical analysis of scriptures when proper help from good sources and tools are used. So a good example of the meaning of words. Uh, Jesus said in in Saint John, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, Yes, Lord, I you know I love thee. Now in the English language, the word love there. Um, we only have one word for love but in the Greek there are four words for love and therefore without understanding the meaning of the word we might miss the context of what was taking place right there in that particular verse so when Jesus said to Peter lovest thou me more than these Jesus used the Greek word uh, agape and Peter said yes Lord you know I love thee but Peter never used the word agape. If you look at it in the original meaning of the word, Peter used the word filio. So when Jesus was asking you, you love me unconditionally, that's what Jesus said to him. And then Peter responded by saying, Lord, you know me like you. Because that's what filio is. Filio has a different type of measurement as it relates to love. So in, we, in order to understand what was taking place, we have to take into consideration the word and the meaning of the word, you know, and this is very important in helping us to get a good exegetical analysis of what is taking place, the context and both the content. What was taking place there? Jesus had to go around and you might ask, wonder why Jesus asked him so much time because Jesus wanted him to love him more than everything else. If you're going to talk about feed my sheep and feed my lamb and all this stuff, you have to love God unconditionally. You have to love God like God intend. You can't just like him unless you'll never succeed in this Christian work. So let's just look at the next thing we have to take into consideration is what is called the hermeneutical application. So generally the study of the methodical principles of interpretation is called hermeneutics and hermeneutics is the science and this is the 
art of interpreting scripture i know the two terms i use it's a science and it's an art all right another definition we can look back at that but another definition is that the science of properly interpreting the various types of literature found in the bible and therefore hermeneutics is not just uh just looking at we have to look at the, the different type of literature that we are reading not all of the scripture is is narrative you have gospel you have proverbs uh, you have different type of literature at our phone and we're going to look at that later on too but let us define what we talk about science and art hermeneutics is a science because it has rules that must be applied when interpreting i going to realize that there are certain rules that we're going to have to use when we actually look at scripture there are certain things that we can put down and say this 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 good hermeneutical practices and we're going to look at some of those again as we go along but these must be applied but it's also an art i know why it's an art it's an art because apart from it you can't it's not a set science not like one plus one equal two you have to sometimes think outside of the box sometimes you have to be thinking hard if you apply uh your what the the, the the logic that god has given you to understand what the scripture is saying you're applying the hermeneutical practices but you're also applying the art of how to get the meaning out of the scriptures praise god now let us continue hallelujah now correct interpreting uh, correct hermeneutics involves two things understanding the word so we need to understand what the scripture is saying and that is exegesis and again exegesis have to do with pulling out the intended meaning out of the verse but also there's another part applying the word we can't fight we can't leave that out because our intention of understanding what the scripture is saying is not to make us uh we call it knowledgeable sinners amen our intention of understanding the word is for us to be able to apply the word so you do what is called exegesis and then you do what is called exposition so a text cannot mean what it could never have meant for its original readers or hearers amen so the the, the, the text I'll say that again cannot mean what it could never have meant for its original readers or hearers what that means is that when paul wrote the scriptures to timothy the same meaning that he intended for them at ephesus to hear when he wrote to timothy is the same meaning it should be applied today there's no change all right so the correct hermeneutics include both the text cannot mean what it could never have meant said that earlier and whatever meaning god intended for us is the same as when it was first spoken or written let's think about you writing a letter to somebody and um you write a letter to a person and you know your reason for writing that letter imagine somebody 10 years down the line take up that letter you would want if that if that reader you're supposed to get really what you were saying they would have to go back to what was your intention of writing the letter and who did you write the letter to and why did you do this and that will give them a context a content all of these things needed for them to rightly interpret what the scripture was actually saying that's in a way when paul wrote or when the scriptures were written uh god's intention or god's message as it was for the first century church same thing applied to us today that is hermeneutics don't try to put our new day type of thing on it look at what it comes from look at this point solid exegesis is the basis for good hermeneutics now let us go back to some terms that we defined it earlier exegesis or eisegesis that was refreshing means actually to put our meaning onto the text exegesis is to pull intended meaning out of the text and therefore what we want to do we want to exegete the verse not ICG the verse we don't want to put what we think it means and then we say hermeneutics is the science and the art of interpreting scriptures and what we just said a while ago good exegesis or exegesis is the proper foundation for proper hermeneutics big terms but it does mean say we want to get what the scripture is actually saying that we can apply it to our lives exegesis before exposition what it means before we can apply it simple that's practically what we are saying so even though hermeneutics in the greek meaning explanation 
Uh, even though hermeneutic, sorry, in the Greek means explanation or interpretation, in sacred theology, it is used in the broader sense to refer to a set of rules or guidelines for interpreting scriptures. So hermeneutic is really a Greek word. It, or it comes out of a Greek word and it means explanation. I think they, they called Paul at one time Hermie. <laughs> Uh, uh, because of uh, and that, that these are in you know, some translations because it actually did a lot of explain, explaining but it's more than that it's more than those explaining it's applying a set of rules or guidelines for how do I interpret what the scriptures are saying now let's just look at some of those rules and some of those guidelines and let's just try to see how best we can apply them the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we must study to show ourselves what approve unto God. It says a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. And I highlight the word, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if there's a right way of interpreting scriptures, there can also be a wrong way of interpreting scriptures. Amen. Because I've seen where people have play some weird interpretation on scriptures and it's based on faulty rules that were used to interpret the scriptures um you do that you didn't know they can use the bible a lot of people don't realize they can use the bible and make any doctrine you can in the world i can tell that the bible says there is no god but in what context the scriptures clearly state that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if I can just take out that little one phrase and say there is no God, then it's a logic statement, it's a logical statement, but it's really outside of its context. And that's just one example, because that's just a piece of a verse. But do you know that people use one particular verse itself, and they make a whole doctrine out of it? Matthew 28 verse 19 is a good example. Go there for a teacher and nation. That one example alone they use and say baptism should be done that particular way, because Jesus said it. But it, it's, it's different in the context of the entire scripture, because all through the book of Acts, baptism was done in Jesus name so therefore for us to get the right interpretation we have to interpret Matthew 28 in the context of entire Bible praise God now look at some key principles of biblical exegesis some rules that we're talking about number one we should use what is called the grammatical historical method of interpreting the Bible rather than an allegorical method. And, 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 and this one big again, but grammatical historical mean you have to take into consideration the grammar of scripture, you have to take into consideration the history that was taking place, as opposed to trying to put some spiritual meaning on it, which is not even there. The illumination of scripture is also necessary. Praise God. By that I mean you need the Holy Ghost to guide us in how we actually, when we look at scriptures. And it's very important that the Holy Ghost is our guide. That is why we pray when we go into our scriptures. Number three, that scriptures are basically clear and meant to be understood. Um, are meant to be understood. So this is very important. A lot of people, they come to the scriptures already thinking that this is outside of you know, if God wrote a letter to you, then God's intention is for you to understand the scripture. So we have to come to the scripture with that mindset that scriptures are basically clear and meant to be understood. The problem is that we sometimes don't get it because we are far removed from the culture of the time. Number four, the Bible is adapted to the human mind. So even though there are some things that might seem hard to understand, it's adaptable to the human mind if we get to that point where we apply it. And number five is that God reveals truth progressively from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So you have to understand when you read from the Old Testament, God progressively reveals his truth to us. For example, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is what is called the first messianic scripture and the first messianic verse in scripture. What God did started there. But as we go through, we start to see more and more light upon how God is going to do his thing. We see which tribe is going to come from, we see which family is going to come from, and it goes all the way down to the rich Calvary progressively reveals what he wants to us number six brothers and sisters scriptures interpret scriptures sometimes you might read a scripture and it seems very far and you probably don't understand it but guess what continue reading sometimes you read something in the book of matthew and in order for you to get a full understanding you have to read the same story in the book of mark if it's there or the same scripture in the book of luke if it's there these are called the synoptic gospels so they tend to be at the same um 
um, line. Um, and therefore, it's very important that you, you, you understand that scriptures will be used to interpret scriptures. The Bible is unified and its central focus is Jesus Christ. So I've, I've been teaching, telling some brethren that I'm actually looking now back at the book of Psalm. Because when the Bible said that the apostles preached Christ through the scriptures, they never used the New Testament. Actually, there was no New Testament in the first century. Amen. What they used was the Old Testament. So everything points back to Christ. Number eight, truth has several witnesses. So we look at it as before in the gospel. In the gospel, uh, for example, of Matthew, you might read a story and um, you might get a, a viewpoint of Matthew wrote based on who he was writing to the audience, the Jews, and therefore he might give you a view. But you might write, read in Luke, I get a different view. It's just a different viewpoint of the same thing. Um, and then I forget the whole picture, you have to see the whole view. That's practically it. Uh, we must use some log rules of logic. God is a logical God. Take it from me. He is. You have to spiritualize everything. There are some things in scripture that are logical. Now, given that the grammatical historical method should be our means of interpreting scriptures, how do we apply it practically to specific passages? And 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 and, and, I, and I'm going to use some examples now because I, I, I know that there are different teachers that are coming to you this week and they're going to be telling you about um interpreting scriptures in their context and looking at all of these things so I, I as I told my goodly friend sister Oshin that I will be trying to use another approach to look at um, how do we apply what's called a grammatical historical method and um, and, and, and I say it's both grammatical grammar and it's historical so there are some things that we have to look at in order for us to understand how we can apply these specific rules that we spoke about and these specific things to our understanding of scriptures shed light upon the scriptures and just to give you a broad view of what these things are you have about four different things that we have to practically look at to 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 apply what is called a grammatical historical method there could be more but there are four broad things that i'm going to put to you today first of all we have to take into consideration the range of critical disciplines so like for example the biblical history we spoke about that earlier there are different different times in history that is covered in the bible so for example when you leave the old testament you are under the rules of the grecians but when you read the new testament you're under you know, the rules of the romans two different people so it's two different times not only that you don't see the word synagogue in the old testament there's nobody going to the synagogue the central place of worship was the temple amen remember the temple was destroyed and it was trying to be rebuilt so you have to look at the history but we're going to the new testament talk about synagogue so different time in history you have the biblical geography amen when the bible talk about the dead sea for example where is the dead sea where is the dead sea good question and then you might think about a sea but the dead sea is practically a lake just a big lake that was about how much meters uh, how much was 600 or something meters below sea level or 600 feet below sea level something like that so it is it's a different setting altogether the geography is very important what the bible said he must needs go through samaria where is samaria there are samaria is between uh judea and galilee galilee i think was to the north judea was to the south and between them was samaria and he had to pass through there and why did the scripture say that you have to look at the biblical culture to in order to understand scriptures what is the culture of the time and 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 and, and, and remember we are westerners so how did they interpret scriptures in the east how do things i've looked at the setting who was there who are the people that was there a lot of questions to be asked but for today i'm going to look at the historical and cultural background just those two now many passages of scriptures that are hard for the westerners to understand are readily explained by a knowledge of the culture history and customs of the bible very important we don't understand it because we don't live within that culture we don't grow up within that culture for example if if, if a Jamaican should say to an American, was sweet nanny goat and the running belly, the American don't understand a thing. That's a Jamaican idiom. It comes from the Jamaican culture and we understand it. If we ignore the culture, praise God, we miss it. We deprive ourselves of a thorough mastery of the bible both of the old testament and the new testament so if we ignore the whole thing about culture we'll miss a whole of things now many 
praise God, passages that we are hard for Westerners to understand are readily explained by a knowledge of the culture, history, and the custom of the Bible. So when we get a good understanding of what the culture is and what was taking place, it gives us a good understanding of how to interpret the scripture. Now, if we ignore the whole thing about culture, which is also a part of interpreting scripture, we deprive ourselves of a thorough mastery of the Bible. And this applies both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What am I saying? Get into the culture. Get into the culture. Are you going to realize how different the culture is? You might think it's just a normal thing, but there are a lot of things that are done in that culture that is totally different than how we do it in our culture today. And if and, and, and therefore, just by looking at it, we might miss a lot of things because we do not understand the culture. Um, when I went to Kenya, we had to study the culture. We had to study how they eat, what they do, how they relate to women, all of these things, so we could be good witnesses in that part of the world. Similar thing applies to the Bible. Get the culture so we can master what the scriptures are saying. Now, the Bible, as I said before, is not a Western book. And as we examine the Eastern settings of the Old Testament and the Greek Roman culture of the New Testament, we will realize that it, is, it will keep us from misunderstanding what the verses are saying. So we have to look at the, 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 the Hebrew settings or the Greek Roman settings of the New Testament or the Hebrew settings of the Old Testament so we can get it. Amen. We can have misunderstanding because the customs were so different, as I said before, that we experience today. They are, they are so different and wide and weird. And if you look, look at them, you might say, my God, what is happening here? But it's, it's just a matter of the culture. And the culture dictates how the writers wrote. And it takes a lot of things for us to get into what the scriptures were saying. For example, let's look at some. In the West, we give up our seats for a woman. True? In the boss, we give up a seat for a woman. In the East, which is where the Bible is written, a woman gives up her seat. Totally different culture. At dinner time in the West, we allow women to be served first. The opposite applies in the East. Men first must be served first, and then the women and children. We sit a lot of time with the Bible talk about, and there were 10,000 men along with women and children. There's a reason why it stays that way. In the West, a man walks side by side with his wife. That's normal, that's nice, that's lovely. I walk with my wife hand in hand. But in the East, the woman walks behind the man. And if she tries to walk beside him, it's not acceptable. It's not the culture. So, these are stuff that we can mix. And there's you know, some things that are different in the culture than what we have it here. And, and, and it looks weird, but that's the culture. Another thing, we write from left to right. And if you know, when you're writing your notes, and people who are making notes know, they will write from left to right. In order to... But in the East, they write from right to left. Totally. So when you read a scroll, for example, a manuscript, you will see them going not from left to right, but from right to left. We sign our signature at the bottom. They sign their signature at the top. That's why Paul's epistles start with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That was a form of signing his scripture. We keep our shoes on when we enter the church. They take off their shoes whenever they enter the holy place. That's why like, the, the religions like the Muslims are, which comes out of that side of the world also, they realize that they take off their shoes. And the same applies in the synagogue. When you're going in, you take off your shoes when you're entering a holy place. Totally different culture and context. Praise God. And these things are very, very important for us to get into what the scriptures were saying. We can build on that. Another thing is, let's just briefly look at two examples where cultural influences or interpretation of a scripture. So two examples we're going to examine uh, where culture influences or interpretation of, of, of particular scriptures. Amen. We can look at two examples through the scripture and see how we can interpret these. So historical and cultural background. Look at the scripture. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare he the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, I mean, we have read the scriptures a lot of times, but there's a lot of culture that is wrapped up in this particular verse that we don't even realize what was taking up 
was taking place or what the prophet or what the writer of Matthew was actually saying. He actually was quoting from the Old Testament, but let's just try to look at this and try to get into some culture as it relates to this particular verse. I see how basically that Holy Square influence our interpretation the next time we look at this particular verse in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. Praise God. Now the first thing you must realize, brothers and sisters, is that this was a prophecy, as I said before, from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. So Matthew was quoting from the Old Testament. Secondly, here are two verses that speak about preparing the way of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Preparing the way of the Lord? Hmm. I mean, it sounds good, but if I should ask you, what was the culture behind it? What was the writer trying to appeal to when he said that? Now, the first we must understand is that the word way, as you prepare the way in the both the Hebrew and the Greek, is the same word for road. In the Hebrew is direct, in the Greek word is hodos, and both words speak to a road. So both words actually speak to a road. A road. Derek in the Hebrew, hodos in the Greek means a road. What's a road? In order to understand, we need to look at roads in Bible time. Now, the roads are a little different now we have it. So you had paths that lead to main roads, that lead to paved roads in the city. So in the city, there were paved roads, but outside of the city, there were those paths, like little dirt tracks. Um, and what was hard about it was that it was difficult to find where you were going. Um, and, 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 and guess what happened? Because you had these little path paths going different places. At different times, these paths become overrun with stones and uh, debris and all kind of things, depending on who using the, 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 the paths. The hard part about it got there was no sign. So when they want to go from one place to the other, and you try to use these paths, there was no sign. So it was very easy for people to get lost. A lot of people don't know. So it was easier in the cities. But when they come outside of the cities, it was hard because there was no sign. There was just these paths which can be clustered by road, by debris and all of that. Now, Jesus made a very important statement. Jesus said, I am the way. He used the same word, hodos, which actually means road. So he was saying, I am the road. Now, within that was a whole heap of things together. Because here's the cry that comes out of the book of Isaiah. In the wilderness, prepare the road of the Lord. That's practically what the scripture was saying. Now, that again, Jesus said he is the road. Now, let me tell you something. Whenever a king or an important official was supposed to come through an era, the following would take place. Remember I said before, you know, there were little dirt parts and sometimes because they were not used probably as often as they should, sometimes they get pulled up with stone or they get overrun with grass and all these type of things. But whenever the king was coming, they would have this cry, prepare the road of the Lord. So this is what actually take place. A messenger of the king would run ahead of the king into all the local farms and the villages and he would shout out, the king is coming Go out and make ready the road. And guess what happened now? All the people would take any rocks that was on the road, cut back the, the, the overhanging branches, and fill in the areas that was washed out and remove any obstacle that was in the road. Now that was that was funny because Jesus said he is the road, you know. And now there's a cry saying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Amen. The king is coming. The king is coming. And I strongly believe that there is a cry going out. And just like how it was sent by the messenger ahead that they should prepare the road. I believe that there is a cry, praise God, that is going out even today. When we look at the scripture in Matthew chapter 3, it should make a big difference in terms of what is taking place. The people would make the road ready. The cry is still going out today. God's road on earth still needs to be prepared. And you and I should do our best to prepare the way, the road for our king. How do we prepare the road for our king? We go ahead of the king. We are messengers. And we are telling the people that look here, the king is coming. Make the road ready. Praise God. So when we look at that scripture, 
it should make a big difference for us because there's an implication for us as children of God. And, and, and what I did was both look at the culture, which is the exegesis, and look at the hermeneutics, which is the application. I've applied it. We as Christians must prepare the road for the Lord. Get ourselves ready and tell people that they need to get ready. Praise God. Another one is that the scripture will talk about let your loins be girded. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What was Jesus saying? If somebody should look at you today and say, gird up your loins, it wouldn't mean much as it would to somebody in the first century or the olden times because there was a whole lot of weight. There was a whole part Jewish culture hidden in the very term, let your loins be girded. Now, let us try to look at some of the stuff that were hidden and what Jesus was actually saying. And I think Peter actually made reference to this to say, gird up your loins. But let's just look at what Jesus was saying to the people in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Praise God. Now, this is an expression or an idiom that was common to the children of Israel. It's not common to us, but it's common to the children of Israel. And we'll find it a couple of times. For example, in the book of Exodus, when they were about to leave, God said they must gird up their lines um, and they shouldn't leave back anything. They were about to leave the uh, uh, Egypt. And God was saying, gird up your lines and get yourself ready to leave. In the book of first king when the prophet was about to run the bible said he girded up in lines and he ran for a couple miles and, and 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 so it's an expression that we find a couple times in scripture it's an expression that is that is that is not unfamiliar to the people or to the jews so when jesus used the term they knew exactly what he was saying now let me tell you why people girded up their lines and this is what makes the interpretation of what jesus was saying to them when you gird your loins, first of all, as you can see here, praise God, what took place? Yes, what took place? For example, the man on the left, his loins was not girded. His clothes is all the way down. He's relaxed. He is just, his clothes are not girded. But the man on the right, he pulled up his clothes. And what did that happen? Within the belt, they would pull up the clothes and they would put it in their belt. Uh... And they do it for a particular reason. Um, so you see the difference between the one that was girded and the one that was not girded. So when Jesus said gird up your lines, that's what the man was doing here. The man was girding, girding his line. But obviously this is not what Jesus was actually saying to the people. He was using what was taking place here to bring across a message. Now what was the message that Jesus wanted to convey to the people that he spoke to in, uh, in the book of Luke? Let's just get an example and take this a little further. Praise God. Now they had to gird the loins because the clothes were very long, as I saw, and would be a determinant from accomplishing a task. So whenever the loins was not girded, it means it was time to relax or take it easy. But whenever the loins was girded, it means it was time for work. So for example, the shoes of Israel gird their loins because they were about to leave. Uh, the, the prophet girded his loins because he was about to run. So when you're about to not take it easy, when you're about to at a state where you're ready to work, you're at a state where you're, you're about to do something, to do a task, whatever the task is, then at that time you would have girded your loins uh, because you're about to move now from a state of relaxation to a state of work, a state of getting things ready. Praise God. So look at the scripture now. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 verse 13. But Peter encouraged us as Christians to do what? Wherefore, gird the loins of your mind. In other words, your mind as a Christian should not be a state of relaxation and ease. But as Christian, your mind must always be at a state where it is working against the enemy. Don't let the enemy trick you. Um, we are not ignorant of his devices. But at the end of the day, we understand that look here, we gird up the, our lines. We put our minds at work. We are not in a state of relaxation. We are in a state of readiness. We are in a state of, 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 of putting ourselves at a place, amen, where if God should come, we should make it. It's with our minds, the scripture says, that we serve the living God. And therefore, Peter was saying, gird up your mind. Get yourself ready. Because 
God is coming. Get yourself ready to do the work of the Lord. Get yourself ready to accomplish what God has want you to do in this earth. Now, there's another part which I'm not going to jump into as it relates to how we interpret scriptures. And as I said before, there are other people who are coming. But there's what is called a genre analysis. And that's very important because when we read scriptures, the scripture was not written in totality. In uh, It's not just one big story. But there are different type of genres uh, that are in scriptures. And a genre can be defined as a category of artistic composition in the context of literature that is characterized by similarities in form, style, or subject matter. So what are some of the, the, the genres that we find in scriptures? And a closing on this slide after this, what are some of the genres we find? And this is very important for us to understand what the scriptures were saying. So genre analysis means represents the entire book as well as the smaller units of scriptures and there are several types of genres that we find in scripture for example poetry like in the book of psalms and the book of songs of songs and the book of proverbs these are poetry you have history books which are practically narrative books like joshua judges Ruth, first kings acts you have letters and we don't interpret letters the same way we interpret history so you have letters like the general epistles and we talk about general epistles that are epistles that were not written by paul so all the letters that in the new testament between Romans and uh, Jude that were not written by Paul are called general. The ones that were written by Paul are called Pauline epistles. Then you have apocalyptic books like Revelation and Daniel, different style. You have gospel, they have in the gospel, you have sub um, genres like parables and so on and so forth. But why I put this out? You don't read poetry the same way you read narratives, you don't read poetry the same way you read apocalyptic. And this is very important for us to understand and for us to interpret what scriptures are saying god bless you i pray god that you did enjoy the session tonight you know there was a lot that was covered um but i pray god that you will use the time um even before we get into defending the scriptures amen but you'll use the time to to go back through and to make some notes you know there were some new words that were introduced. I mean, we talk about grammatical, historical, we talk about exegesis, uh, we talk about eisegesis, I mean, we talk about the whole cultural practices. There are some new concepts that were introduced as we went through. I mean, we talk about genre analysis. You know, all of these things are new, but they're important. And, and I strongly believe that Faith Chapel is a mature house. Amen. So as we get into the word, it's very important that we uh, learn some of these things so that we can be able to rightly divide the word of truth, do proper hermeneutics, as the term is. Amen. So that we can get into what the scripture is saying. So that we'll be able to use our tools effectively. When the enemy comes, we are able to use the word of God with accuracy your accuracy we're able to cut straight and apply the word as it should be applied praise god bow your heads tonight as we close out in prayer great god we thank you lord for tonight we thank you lord for what was covered tonight we thank you lord god for your word which is spirit and your word which is life god we have covered a lot tonight but i pray god that persons who partake in this bible study hey god that they will that, that they have learned something and those who some things were not very clear that they will go back over it, praise God, so that they can apply it. I pray God that every student tonight of the scripture will become better at interpreting the word, better at understanding the word. God, your word was for us, for, for food for our hearts. Your word is what strengthens us. David said it a couple of times in the Psalms, that is the word of God, which gives him strength. He even went on to say that is the word of God, which is a light unto his feet. A uh, lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path. I pray, God, that he'll help us, Lord Jesus, that we might be not novice in handling the word, but help us, Lord Jesus, to be students. Or oh, like the Church of Burial, help us, Lord Jesus, to diligently seek out the word of God so that we'll be able to rightly divide it. Thank you for every person that was on tonight. And I pray, God, that you will continue to bless this house, continue, Lord Jesus, to bless Bishop Daly, continue, Lord Jesus, to bless every elder, every minister, every saint, every head of department. And help us, Lord Jesus, as we work together, oh God, that we'll continue, Lord Jesus, to apply the word to our life. For where we tell you, says, shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. Thank you one more time in the most exalted and the majestic name, the name of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. God bless you. And see you next week. 
as God's willing, or the other week. I think we have communion coming up one of these weeks. But see you in our next study as we get into how to defend the word. This time we'll look at it from no, not a hermeneutics perspective, but from apolo apologetics perspective in terms of defending what the word of God has to say. God bless you in the most exalted name of Jesus. God bless you in Jesus' name.